So welcome, honored guests and distinguished members of our university community and all who have made their way on this beautiful day to today's 27th annual University of Michigan Senate's Davis Markert Nickerson Lecture on Academic and Intellectual Freedom. I'm Robert Ortega, faculty at the School of Social Work and chair of the Senate Advisory Committee on University Affairs and Senate Assembly. It's our pleasure to, today to present uh, events as part of our University of Michigan's bicentennial celebration and in collaboration with MC Squared Michigan in the Climate Crisis, which is a, has a week-long series of events organized to explore the role of the university in the climate crisis. After today's lecture, you're invited to attend a political panel with Sandra Steingraber, uh, climate activist and author, and Stephen Mulkey, President Emeritus of Unity College, from 7 to 8.30 at uh, 1040 Dana Commons, then there will be a reception before the event in Dana Commons. I'll direct your attention to the flyers that you received as you are entering and make uh, an additional mention of Bill McKibben's uh, keynote lecture at Hill Auditorium at 5 this coming Thursday. This lecture affirms the faculty's firm belief that academic and intellectual freedom are fundamental values for a university in a free society. We recognize that these values and rights are constantly vulnerable to fears and efforts to censor unpopular ideas, and that, and that the protection of academic and intellectual freedom requires continuous reminders of their value and vulnerability. At this point, I would like to introduce Peggy Hollingsworth, president of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund since 1991. Peggy's leadership and contributions to faculty governance and service have been widely recognized. She's worked tirelessly to help organize and raise funds to support this lecture series. And it is my pleasure to welcome Peggy to the podium and where she will introduce our honored guest, Chancellor Davis. When, on behalf of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund, I contacted Michael Mann to be the 2017 Davis Market Nickerson Lecture. He agreed despite a very demanding schedule. Needless to say, we were delighted and look forward to his visit with us. His lecture today would undoubtedly add to the other scholarly jewels in the crown of the lecture series of the Davis Market Nickerson Lecture on Academic and Intellectual Freedom. Professor Mary Crichton, then president of the University of Michigan chapter of the American Association of University Professors, AAUP, sent a letter on November 1, 1989 to the Senate Advisory Committee on University Affairs, SACUA, the executive committee of the faculty, to quote, request that SACUA consider the AAUP proposal that the university make a significant gesture of reconciliation to the three suspended professors, end quote for the egregious treatment to which they had been subjected. That year, it was already over three decades since the 1954 hearings of those three professors before a subgroup of the House on american Activities Committee and their initial suspensions from the university. Some of us on SACUA at the time, with the support and assistance of our co colleagues in AUP, initiated the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund and annual lectures to honor the bravery and integrity of Professors Davis, Markert, and Dickerson. These outstanding lectures have continued annually now for nearly 30 years, emphasizing the critical importance of academic and intellectual freedom, especially in academic settings. It is through the dedication and nurturing of AFLF members and board of directors that all of us have been enriched by this series of presentations. One does have to wonder, however, why it took almost 36 years from those professors' initial suspensions by the university for this fitting response to come from the faculty. Unfortunately, two of our honorees, Clement Markert and Mark Nickerson, are no longer with us. 
However, I am very pleased that our third honoree, Chandler Davis, is here with us as he has been each year since Robert O'Neill's inaugural lecture in 1991, with the exception of last year when his wife, Natalie Zeman Davis, was recovering from surgery. A summary of his many accomplishments is in your program. Chandler has agreed to make a few comments. We look forward with great anticipation to the sonnet he promised when I contacted him to make a presentation this year. Thank you. It's uh, pleasant to find myself again in the chair opening a seminar at the University of Michigan. The last time I did, it was the Science Research Club. That was a group of 70 or so faculty scientists who met once a month to hear a lecture on science across the board, anything from astronomy to microbiology. I took on the task of organizing it that academic year uh, to general approval, I, if I do say so. <laughs> now here I am again. This time not for the Science Research Club, but for the Academic Freedom Lecture. There's been a lapse of 63 years. There's a delicious irony about this. In 1954, a committee of, the, of members of the Academic Senate, appointed by the Senate, under Professor Angus Campbell, unanimously advised the Board of Regents to expel me from the university, which the Regents did. And then in the late 1980s, the same Academic Senate remarkably looked again at the history and called on the Regents also to reevaluate it. A nearly uh, unprecedented turnaround. The regents did not. That's when the Senate, as Peggy has recounted, that's when the Senate decided the university needed an annual public uh, uh, meeting on the problem of permitting nonconformity on campus and set up the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund to fill this need. Good, said Clem Marker. If the regents had simply apologized, that would have been the end of it. This way, the campus gets reminded every year. And so it has happened for 27 years now to general approval with invited speakers like Catherine R. Stimson, Roger Wilkins, um, uh, uh, Ellen Schrecker, David Cole, Noam Chomsky. You're in good company. For, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, Michael's lecture, but I don't want it to begin without giving some appreciation for the extraordinary accomplishment. I can praise it unstintingly because it was not my, it was not my doing. Uh, this, um, the program calls me an honoree, but my principal role is a rank and file supporter. The people who did it had to convince the academic senate to see that they should acknowledge a blemish on the university's record. And that took patient and able advocacy by Wilfred Kaplan, Mary Crichton, William Alexander, known as Buzz Alexander, David Hollinger, C.B. Smith, known as Tad Smith, and others. And then, second thing had to be done, the commitment to produce a substantial and challenging annual lecture had to be carried out. And that took devoted uh, labors by the original gadflies, of course, and uh, several recruits over the years. And the center of this amazing crew was Peggy Hollingsworth, the partner of Tad Smith in life, in research, and in service to academe. Uh, Tad, as many of you know, uh, died last year, and this was a grievous loss not only to Peggy but to the world. Peggy has carried on nobly 
and the fund is strong as ever, thanks largely to her dedication and her good sense, diplomatic without being easily dissuadable, and um, wise in political and intellectual wisdom. Um, I, I joked about writing a sonnet, and uh, uh, Peggy took me up on it, so I had, had to write a sonnet. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, this concerns one moment in the events of 1954. The list of victims of the Red Hunters had been pared down to only two, Mark Nickerson and myself. And uh, the, uh, Angus Campbell's committee was charged with uh, advising uh, the university what to do about us. Uh, we thought they ought to tell the university, this is uh, interference with academic freedom. Tell them to go fly a kite. Um, but the Campbell committee decided to play along in the hopes that they could reduce the number of victims from two to one. And, and um, uh, uh, so this is my, this is my uh, reaction. The wolves of anti-rationality bay fearsomely around the courthouse door. Judge Angus Campbell tr is trying Nick and me, the sacrificial lambs they slabber for. But Angus, stay. Don't judge us by the rules imposed by free inquiry's enemies to take their law book uh, uh, would be, uh, uh, to take the law book of these rabid fools betrays your court's traditional liberties. Angus, unmoved, decrees he will use the wolves criteria so that they may be content with just a single victim. Whom to choose? Davis, he's young and more intransigent. So, the wolves ax me, as Angus asked them to, but not a whit appeased, take Nick's job too. And now to introduce our keynote speaker is Dr. Mark Schlissel, um, pre the 14th president of the University of Michigan. In his remarks to graduates at our 2015 winter commencement, he reminded us of the values we place on academic, intellectual, and expressive freedoms in pursuit of knowledge and understanding. And despite the fact that many campuses succumb to the scaremongering and demagoguery of the McCarthy era, he drew attention to the important relationship between academic integrity and academic freedom. That was challenged then, and that we must continue to uphold without fear or compromise. Please help me welcome President Mark Schlissel. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, uh, Professor Ortega, for the introduction, and also thank you for serving as the chair of SACUA this year. So your service to the uh, faculty and your service to the university are appreciated. I'd like to extend my own special welcome, although not in a poetic form, uh, to Professor Chandler Davis, whose unfair treatment here over 60 years ago continues to inspire the University of Michigan community to always remember our highest academic values as we strive to uphold this university as a true marketplace of ideas. I also express my appreciation to the University of Michigan's Faculty Senate 
to Dr. Hollingsworth and all the members of our community who've worked to preserve the values of academic and intellectual freedom both here at the University of Michigan and beyond. This lecture and everything it stands for has been made so meaningful as a result of the work of many people in our community. I hope that the University of Michigan will always be an inalienable forum for discovery, debate, and discussion, a place where respect and disagreement are complementary, where each makes the other stronger, and where we all advocate for and learn from their confluence. The Davis, Markert, and uh, Nickerson Academic Freedom Lecture raises the level of conversation and debate on our campus. It addresses essential aspects of free expression and thought and gives our community the opportunity to engage with some of the world's leading minds. It also helps us to remember and learn from the mistakes of the past, including those made by the university when it sought to silence the scholars who are the namesake of this lecture. At a place like the University of Michigan, it is essential that we never stop learning, thinking, and questioning ourselves, our society, and our role in the world. Today's lecturer is uniquely suited to discuss these ideas. Dr. Michael E. Mann is a scientist, author, and outspoken advocate for the role of science in influencing policy decisions. Through the intersection of these qualities, he is one of our nation's leading voices in the battle against climate change caused by human activity. Dr. Mann has received threats on his life, threats to his job, and threats to his family since publishing research that illustrated an upward trending temperature curve due to global warming. He's continued to speak out and to share his scientific research broadly and to, in his words, ensure that the policy debate is informed by an honest assessment of the risks. Dr. Mann is a distinguished professor of atmospheric science at Penn State University and is director of Penn State's Earth System Science Center. He's written three books, is the author of more than 200 peer-reviewed and edited publications, and in 2015 was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In a New York Times opinion piece in 2014, Dr. Mann wrote that it is no longer acceptable for scientists to remain on the sidelines. If scientists choose not to engage in a public debate, he continued, we leave a vacuum that will be filled by those whose agenda is one of short-term self-interest. There's a great cost to society if scientists fail to participate in the larger conversation. In fact, it would be an abrogation of our responsibility to society if we remained quiet in the face of such a grave threat. Friends and colleagues, please help me welcome the 2017 Davis, Market and Nickerson Academic Freedom Lecture, Dr. Michael Mann. Well, thanks so much, uh, President Schlissel, uh, and thanks to all of you who helped uh, arrange uh, this series. Uh, I do feel the weight uh, of the legacy uh, of this series, and, it, and it's an honor um, to in indeed have one of the individuals um, whose namesake is, is honored. Um, I uh, am going to talk about the issue of human-caused climate change um, here on a brisk October uh, 84 degree day in Ann Arbor. Uh, I, I spent a year uh, in Ann Arbor. Uh, I went to kindergarten at the Stone School. Uh, <laughs> my father was uh, on sabbatical in the math department here at the University of Michigan, and I do remember some 84 degree days, but those were in the summer, they weren't in October. Um, so the topic here, um, the Madhouse Effect. Uh, this is a book that I co-authored with uh, Tom Tolles, who's the editorial cartoonist for the Washington Post, uh, more than a year ago, actually last, uh, last September. Um, the title, uh, The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics, and Driving Us Crazy. Now, some people have argued that it was prescient uh, for us to write a book um, on this topic uh, with this title um, in September of last year. Um, 
because, of course, a, a book about climate change uh, based mostly on cartoons is one that might actually be read by our president. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about climate change denial in the age of Trump, um, in this environment that we now find ourselves in, um, an environment of uh, alternative facts and fake news. Uh, those of us who have been on the front lines of the climate change debate, uh, were dealing with fake news and alternative facts before they were in fashion. Um, and now, of course, this infection that afflicted our discourse over climate change has now uh, taken hold in our, our entire body politic. So let's first try to you know, get something straight here. When it comes to science, skepticism is a good thing. Okay? Uh, people who doubt the evidence, who reject uh, the overwhelming consensus of the world's scientists, uh, they're not skeptics. Um, these, these are you know, contrarians um, uh, or denialists, if they're literally denying the evidence. Now, uh, the great Carl Sagan, who spoke eloquently on the topic of scientific skepticism and the importance of skepticism as part of the self-correcting machinery of science, I think put it best when he noted that uh, the fact that uh, some geniuses were laughed at uh, does not imply that all who are laughed at are geniuses. <laughs> they laughed at Columbus. They laughed at the Wright brothers. They laughed at Fulton, but they also laughed at Bozo the Clown. And for every Fulton, for every Galileo, um, there are a thousand Bozos the Clown. And now uh, they happen to find themselves with a megaphone. Uh, climate change denialism now has a voice as expressed in our highest political office in this country. Now, one of the pet peeves of those of us who participate in the larger discussion about climate change and its impacts and solutions is uh, the, the phenomenon of uh, false balance, where you know, when climate change um, is uh, a topic um, on a news show, they feel the need um, to have, alongside with a scientist, a climate change contrarian, uh, when anywhere from 97 to 99 percent of scientists uh, recognize, agree with the scientific consensus that climate change is real, it's human caused, it's already a problem. Um, but somehow there is this need in our media uh, sort of environment to treat it as if it is a contested issue and to have a climate change contrarian alongside a climate scientist any time any time the topic is discussed. Um, when it comes to uh, the theory of gravity, um, we don't have you know, a physicist along with a, a president of the Flat Earth Society to debate them. And yet we do feel the need, uh, or the media feels the need to do that when it comes to the topic of climate change. And it isn't just the conservative media, uh, the fringe media, uh, the New York Times um, this year uh, introduced a columnist, um, Brett Stevens, who uh, denies uh, the reality and, and threat of climate change impacts. Um, and so this has really infected our entire uh, media, the, the notion that we have to treat climate change as if um, it's a debated proposition. When it comes to the scientific evidence, there's about as strong a consensus about climate change as there is about gravity. And yes, there's uncertainty when it comes to gravity. Uh, we still haven't observed a graviton. Um, we haven't unified all of the forces of nature. So you could say there's some, still some uncertainty about gravity. But that doesn't make it safe to jump off a cliff. And yet there are those who would use the notion that there's still some uncertainty about some aspects of the science of climate change as reason to jump off the metaphorical cliff of refusing to act on this problem before it's too late. A pet peeve of mine is uh, the way that um, the connection between climate change and extreme weather events is dealt with. Um, and you know, you'll often hear 
uh, the assertion uh, that you know climate change uh, when we have some super storm, some unprecedented meteorological event, you know maybe that storm was one of mine and maybe it wasn't. You can't prove a thing. Um, uh, it's a loophole you could lose a planet through, um, as the small print says here. And indeed, that's the case. Uh, the question whether we can prove that climate change caused some particular storm is the wrong question. It's an irrelevant question. The, the relevant question is, um, are the impacts of these storms being made worse by climate change? Are they becoming more common, um, whether it's Hurricane Harvey, the biggest flooding event on record, the de devastation done by Irma, the strongest storm as measured by peak winds ever in the open Atlantic um, this season. Now, the last two years have been the warmest years globally, um, the warmest years when you look at global sea surface temperatures. Uh, we know that the energy for the intensification of uh, hurricanes uh, comes from the warmth of those waters, and there are some fairly fundamental theories based essentially on thermodynamics that predict that as those sea surface temperatures warm, uh, we get more and more extreme, uh, more and more intense hurricanes. Um, so some would say it's a coincidence that in the last two years when global surface temperatures have been uh, the warmest on record, we've had the strongest storm ever measured in the world. Um, that was Hurricane Patricia, over 200 mile per hour winds in the Pacific. That's also the strongest storm in the Pacific and in the Northern Hemisphere. We also had the strongest storm in the Southern Hemisphere, which was uh, Winston, um, which uh, uh, struck Fiji, um, the strongest storm ever recorded in the Southern Hemisphere, the Northern Hemisphere, the Pacific, and now with Irma, the open Atlantic. Maybe it's a coincidence that all of that happened during the last two years when global sea surface temperatures were at an all-time high. I don't think it is a coincidence. Um, and then, of course, it didn't stop with Irma. Uh, we saw the devastation, uh, and we are still seeing, and we are still experiencing the devastation done by Maria, which um, essentially destroyed uh, Puerto Rico. Um, more warmth in the ocean, at the ocean surface, means stronger storms. Warmer ocean temperatures means more moisture in the atmosphere. More moisture in the atmosphere means more rainfall. Uh, especially for storms that stall, like, the, that, like Harvey did. Um, not a coincidence. Why should we care? Um, next chapter in the book. Um, well, you know, polar bears and penguins are nice. And I'd like to have them around. <laughs> I'd like my daughter to um, experience uh, the, the wonder of nature that, that I experienced in my lifetime. I don't want these you know, magnificent creatures like the, the polar bear to go extinct, but it's not just about polar bears and penguins. Um, it's about devastating superstorms, um, unprecedented droughts and floods and heat waves. The impacts of climate change are no longer subtle. We are seeing them play out in real time on our television screens, uh, in our newspaper headlines. Well, there has been a denial industry. There are vested interests who understandably would like to see us uh, stay, in the words uh, former President George uh, W. Bush, uh, stay addicted to fossil fuels. And they fought tooth and nail um, to ensure that that be the case um, by attacking the science uh, linking climate change to the burning of fossil fuels by attempting to discredit uh, the science and often by trying to discredit the scientists themselves. Um, and I have found myself in the crosshairs of those attacks. Um, and denialism sort of works like this. Uh, the first stage of denial, because as we all know, there are stages of denial and we have to work our way through the various stages of denial. The first stage of denial is it's not happening. How many of you have heard that there was a pause in global warming, that there was a hiatus in global warming? Anyone read headlines or claims like that in the media? Um, well, let's see, 2014 was the warmest year on record until 2015. 
which was the warmest year on record, until 2016, which was the warmest year on record. The numbers aren't yet in for 2017. Um, now, the next stage of denial is, okay, yeah, it's been really warm, but you know, maybe that's natural. Um, you know, stovetop temperatures change naturally. <laughs> maybe it's natural. Well, actually, we published an article earlier this year to actually look at that. Um, we estimated, um, using a, a method that involves climate models and observational data, what was the likelihood of three consecutive record-breaking global temperatures, both with and without the effect of global warming. Um, and uh, we have a nice abstract here, which refers to the coupled model intercomparison project phase five, uh, a, P, a likelihood of less than 0.03% consecutive records, 0.7% uh, in its absence. When, well, I could read you the whole abstract, but I think that this article um, in Discover that talked about our findings probably did a better uh, job of communicating or the basic essence of our finding. Um, uh, it's not natural. It's not natural. Um, snowstorm in Washington, D.C. doesn't disprove climate change, despite a senator from Oklahoma who might like you to think that. Um, I have to tell a short story. Uh, Senator Inhofe, um, who has declared climate change to be the greatest hoax ever perpetrated um, on the American people. Um, uh, coincidence, by the way, he is one of the largest recipients of fossil fuel money in the US Senate, probably just a coincidence. Um, well, he was invited in 2011 to give the keynote speech at the annual climate change denial conference of the Heartland Institute. The Heartland Institute is a industry front funded think tank. It was supported by the tobacco industry to try to debunk the science linking their product to human health effects and uh, today is working to discredit the science of climate change. And in 2011, James Inhofe was invited to be their keynote speaker. He had accepted the invitation, um, but at the last minute he had to back out. Uh, he had gotten ill uh, swimming in a lake back in his home state of Oklahoma. The lake was suffering uh, an algal bloom as a result of the unprecedented heat and drought that Oklahoma was experiencing that summer. Uh, so James Inhofe was unable to give that speech. Well, the next line, um, next rung in this ladder of denial, is okay, well, you know, maybe it's not entirely natural, but hey, it's self-correcting, right? The sea levels climb to the point where they snuff out the coal-fired power plants, you know, it's self-correcting. Um, well, unless you mean by self-correcting that we literally unbury all of the carbon that was buried over 100 million years since the early Cretaceous by natural processes, what we're doing is we're taking all that carbon that was around when the dinosaurs were roaming the planet, um, and it got buried over 100 million years under the ground, we are digging it up and putting it back into the atmosphere, but not over a time frame of 100 million years. We're doing it over a time frame of 100 years, a million times faster. And there's no reason to believe that we or other living things can adapt to such un unprecedented rates of change in our environment. So no, in no meaningful way is it self-correcting, Oh, maybe it's a good thing. All right, it's not self-correcting. It'll be good for us. Um, it's a little bit of warming. Melting ice sheets lift all boats, after all. Uh, well, unless you mean that you know, devastating flooding of uh, Houston, um, and they're still dealing with the health uh, effects of that flooding. Uh, people are dying from diseases, waterborne illnesses. The devastation that we're seeing unfold in real time that's continuing to unfold in Puerto Rico, um, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, and if you look objectively at the impacts of climate change on food, on water, on human health, on our economy, on national security across the board, um, climate change is already doing great damage. And if we continue on this road, uh, we will see truly catastrophic and irreversible impacts of climate change. Not a good thing. Not a good thing. Unprecedented drought in California, not a good thing. Unprecedented drought in Syria, worst drought in 900 years that forced rural farmers into the cities where they were competing for food and water and space with the people in those cities, creating an atmosphere of unrest um, in which organizations like ISIS can flourish. Um, probably not a good thing, probably not a good thing. 
the West is burning. Uh, as we continue to be preoccupied in the eastern U.S. by these unprecedented storms that have wrought unprecedented destruction, meanwhile, uh, the western U.S. is experiencing unprecedented heat, um, unprecedented wildfire. Um, there was uh, an article in the Washington Post, an op-ed in the Washington Post, the American West is burning. It was by Steve, Steve Daines, a Republican um, senator representing Montana. Uh, it failed to mention climate change or global warming. Um, you can't solve a problem. <laughs> you can't solve a problem if you don't recognize the cause. Um, other articles have been a little more blunt about the cause. Why is the West burning? This article in Outside Magazine. Extreme heat. The drought persists despite a wet winter. Um, it's not rocket science. Extreme heat, extreme drought, extreme wildfire, unprecedented wildfire. And again, threat multiplier. Uh, more competition, growing global population for food and water and land as our coastlines are flooded, as the tropics become unlivable, too hot. Um, that's a prescription for conflict and for a national security nightmare. So even if you don't care about any of the other impacts of climate change, if you care about national security, you should care about climate change. Well, and then the final sort of uh, rung in the ladder of denial. Okay, well, you know what? We just spent all this time debating uh, the problem, and <laughs> it's too late. It's too late to do anything. Um, the good news is it isn't too late. Um, and I think there'll be a number of uh, talks here over the next uh, several days by people at the forefront of the climate movement who are paving the way um, to uh, action. Um, and there is still a path forward. It isn't too late. So there has been, as I mentioned before, this effort, um, you know, the denialism of climate change uh, didn't just uh, emerge organically. It has been carefully cultivated by fossil fuel interests who have spent tens of millions of dollars uh, in a massive disinformation campaign intended to confuse the public and confuse policymakers about the science. And it's often involved uh, attacks on climate scientists. The war on climate science will probably continue on. Um, it's like the last Japanese soldier still fighting World War II. As long as there are fossil fuels to be burned, we will still encounter climate change denialism. But it will become irrelevant. We will have moved on. Now, when it comes to climate change denialism, as we've already seen uh, with the anecdote uh, about uh, James Inhofe, um, there is some amount of uh, irony, uh, one might say hypocrisy, when it comes to the denial of climate change. Um, as folks have alluded to, I have experienced uh, some of that myself. I've been at the receiving end of uh, congressional inquiries and uh, threatened subpoenas. Uh, and then there was um, Ken Cuccinelli. Uh, to me, he's the cooch. Um, if you know him well, he's the, he's the cooch, uh, Ken Cuccinelli, the former attorney general of Virginia. Um, who attempted to subpoena all of my personal emails from the time that I was a faculty member at the University of Virginia, presumably in an effort to try to find something in my personal emails to embarrass me, to, to, to discredit the iconic hockey stick graph that I had published, um, be had become this sort of icon in the climate change debate. Well, uh, Ken Cuccinelli's uh, congressional subpoena was rejected by the lower court. Um, uh, on a, well, let me say, first of all, that the Washington Post uh, weighed in on the matter not once or twice or three times or four times, but at least five times. Uh, at least five times the Washington Post um, sort of weighed in uh, denouncing Ken Cuccinelli's witch hunt against me and the University of Virginia. Um, what they saw as an obvious effort to intimidate an academic whose findings might be inconvenient to the special interests that fund Mr. Cuccinelli. Um, Tom Tolles, award-winning cartoonist to the Washington Post, uh, weighed in on the matter not once, but uh, twice. Uh, and I have to confess, this is my favorite here. Uh, it's poor Galileo down here. Uh, and Cuccinelli wants his emails, too. Um, I don't mind being compared to Galileo, I guess. Uh, well, the Cooch is, uh, 
His subpoena was quashed uh, by the lower court on, on a mere technicality. Um, in his 40-page uh, filing to the court, he had failed to provide uh, evidence of wrongdoing on my part. Um, and so the, the case was thrown out. Of course, he appealed to the state Supreme Court, um, which uh, a couple years later ruled uh, against uh, Cuccinelli with prejudice, meaning, uh, well, you guys, this is, this is a law school, you know. They, they really would like to not see him ever come back to the court with something like that again. Um, so that was um, a battle that was won. Now, Cuccinelli wasn't done. He ran for governor. Um, of Virginia in the next election, um, and I dutifully campaigned uh, for his opponent, Terry McAuliffe. Uh, there's me, Terry, and, and Bill. I got to introduce Bill Clinton, who introduced Terry McAuliffe in the final rally um, in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, and McAuliffe uh, was victorious. Um, and in fact, his folks say that if you looked at the internal numbers, Ken Cuccinelli's assault on the University of Virginia and me probably bought them several percent, uh, several percent um, in, in, in the final tally. Um, even conservatives, uh, conservative Virginians, didn't like the idea of an attorney general uh, attacking Thomas Jefferson's university and, and professors at Thomas Jefferson's university. Um, Terry won by less than 1%, by the way. Ken Cuccinelli, um, and you know, look this up yourself, Google it. Um, you know, you can't make this stuff up, I promise. Um, he, he went on to work on an oyster farm on Tangier Island. This is an island in the Chesapeake Bay that is slowly succumbing to the effects of global sea level rise. Um, hypocrisy, <laughs> uh, climate change denial is thy name. Well, what about the solutions? We're getting close to the end here. Um, well, you know, we could listen to folks like uh, CEO, ExxonMobil CEO, oh, oh sorry, I mean um, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, um, who sees geoengineering. Geoengineering uh, will just massively interfere with this system that we don't understand perfectly in the hope that maybe we'll offset global warming. We'll shoot stuff into the stratosphere or dump things into the ocean, maybe put mirrors in space. Um, and some of the adherents uh, to geoengineering are our um, current uh, Secretary of State, uh, Rex Tillerson, who sees climate change as just an engineering problem. It's just a problem we can engineer our way out of. Um, and this is sort of popular. This is um, what I sometimes refer to as the kinder, gentler form of denialism that we now encounter, which isn't outright rejection of the science but it is uh, the argument that um, we don't need to do anything about it. The impacts aren't that bad, and if we want to do something about the impacts, we'll just uh, engage in some techno fix. Um, and what's so remarkable about those who advocate this, like the, the Breakthrough Institute, there's a group called the Breakthrough Institute, and who, who wouldn't be for a breakthrough? Except the, the Breakthrough Institute doesn't seem interested in any genuine breakthroughs at all. Um, uh, in fact, you know, if you ask them, you know, what if, you know, the Breakthrough Institute also uh, supports geoengineering? Again, we'll, inter you know, we'll interfere in some massive way um, uh, at a global scale in an unprecedented manner um, using the stuff of science fiction to try to cover up the effect of global warming. Uh, and then when you ask folks like the Breakthrough Institute, you say, well, you know, what if we were just a thought. What if we were to take existing renewable energy technology and we were to scale it up to meet our growing energy uh, needs? It's like, no way could you do that. There's just no way you could possibly do that. Um, there seems to be some asymmetry in their skepticism, if you want to call it that, when it comes to solutions. So the real solution, of course, the real path forward is to solve the problem at its source, is to do something about the ongoing accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, we've seen some real progress here in recent years, the Paris Accord. Um, nearly 200 nations from around the world um, agreeing to make substantial cuts in carbon emissions. And if you tally up the net effect of those commitments, it's enough to get us halfway from where we would be heading towards truly catastrophic climate change. To four to five degrees Celsius, seven to nine degree Fahrenheit warming of the planet by the end of the century. 
gets us halfway to where scientists say we need to be at two degrees Celsius or below. Two degrees Celsius or below. We've already warmed a little more than a degree. We don't have much left, but we can still stabilize warming below two degrees Celsius. Paris Accord gets us halfway there. It doesn't solve the problem. And some of the critics will say, well, the Paris Accord doesn't solve the problem. Well, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? <laughs> um, it, it puts in place a framework that we can build upon and we can ratchet up those commitments uh, at the next conference of the parties, we can now see a path forward. We can see a path forward to stabilizing warming below dangerous levels. And of course, we've had the moral leadership of, the, um, of Pope Francis um, and um, the Vatican weigh in um, to uh, sort of recenter the debate where it should be centered because this isn't just a matter of science or politics or economics. Um, it's a matter of ethics. It's a matter of intergenerational ethics. Do we want to leave behind a degraded planet for future generations? And I think we need to firmly recenter the debate um, as a debate over ethics, or intergenerational ethics um, and ethical obligations to others on the planet today. And the Pope has helped do that. So we've seen some real progress, but we've encountered an obstacle or two as well. Um, when the book, when the galleys came back uh, last uh, September, a year ago, um, or actually late August, um, we're looking through the book and it's like, Tom, we don't have a Trump cartoon in this book. And it was starting to appear that maybe Donald Trump might be relevant to, to what happens. Um, so at the last minute, uh, Tom uh, drew up a cartoon and it's of course about a wall. Donald Trump building a wall that we will all pay for. Um, the wall between him and the evidence uh, for climate change. And we have encountered this setback. Um, uh, Trump threatening to back out of the Paris Accord. Um, threatening um, to, uh, to eliminate the clean power plan that put us on the right path with our uh, power related carbon emissions and to roll back um, automobile efficiency standards. Um, Scott Pruitt, the EPA administrator under Trump is literally undoing 50 years of environmental progress. Um, progress made, I would remind folks, under both Republican and Democratic administrations, um, unprecedented and so we, we are confronted with this challenge. Um, now, it turns out that we can still meet our obligations under Paris, whether or not Trump claims to pull out of Paris or not. There's enough progress being made at the municipal level, at the state level, that we, there's a good chance we'll get there regardless of what actions the executive branch uh, takes. But it's gonna be difficult to make forward progress um, in an environment where Polluters and deniers um, run uh, the executive branch, which is where we are today. Um, for one thing, yes, and there's um, Scott Pruitt, who is a darling of the Koch brothers and is literally dis dismantling all the environmental protections of the last half century. Uh, Rex Tillerson, former CEO of ExxonMobil, now our Secretary of State. Um, and this guy who would eliminate the Department of Energy if he could remember it, um, which he now runs. So we have to be, make sure our voices are heard. I've been doing the best that I can um, to make my voice heard. Um, spoke at the rally in Washington, D.C., um, marched in Washington, D.C., and everybody was asking, you know, who's, who's, who's that guy with Mike Mann at the front of the line? Um, <laughs> Bill Nye, my good friend Bill Nye has been out there. Um, Bill Nye, the science guy, doing everything he can to, to focus attention on this problem. Um, and it takes all of us making our voices heard. We've seen that that matters. Despite the challenges we have in our politics today, the, the, the voice of the people still matters. Uh, we saw that in the healthcare debate. Um, and so it is more essential than ever that we make our voices heard in every way possible. Um, Governor McAuliffe, um, uh, who um, I campaigned with um, when he ran for governor of Virginia, was one of the first governors um, to, when Trump said he was pulling out of Paris, Terry said, 
Virginia is staying in. We are committed to our obligations under the Paris Accord. Um, uh, Terry once said to me um, that elections matter. Uh, and, and here's an example. Um, elections do matter. We've got a really important midterm election coming up um, in a year or so. Um, things can change quickly. Uh, political winds can change quickly. So let me just remind you that um, you know, the earth quite literally does lie in the balance. Um, so the decisions that we make and the actions we take in the years ahead are going to determine what sort of planet we leave behind for our children, grandchildren. There's still time to make sure that we leave behind the sort of planet that we would like to. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to field questions. Yes, Steve. Uh, Mike, there's a group at, uh, your, at Harvard that is working uh, in a high-profile project on geoengineering. I wonder if you could comment on like, the plan here. Right, I can restate the question. Uh, yeah. Mike, there's a group at Harvard that's working on geoengineering. They've been rather high-profile in advertising their intentions. And I wonder if you could comment on the research they're doing and the way they're going about it. Yeah, thanks for the question. So it's an interesting sort of quandary. Um, geoengineering, even if we believe it's a bad thing, and I believe in the law of unintended consequences. Um, you know, I'm one of those people who grow, grew up, you know, listening to the song about there was an old lady who swallowed a fly. And what killed her wasn't the fly, it was the horse, of course. It was the bad solution to the problem, to the initial problem. And one might argue that many of these geoengineering uh, solutions suffer from the same malady. But an argument can be made, and is made passionately by some of my colleagues who I respect greatly, that we should study them so that we can explore some of those potential unintended consequences. And some of the research into geoengineering has indeed revealed um, some of the disturbing potential consequences, particularly with the scheme where we, um, you know, volcanoes cool the planet for a few years because of all these particles uh, called aerosols that form because of the, 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 the stuff that gets up into the stratosphere, forms this blanket that blocks out some of the sun. Um, and so one of the geoengineering schemes is to mimic what a volcano does, but to do it every few years, do the equivalent of a, you know, Mount Pinatubo-like eruption every other year to constantly force Earth's climate system, putting these particles, so literally taking guns and shooting particles into the stratosphere where they remain uh, for several years. And if we do this often enough and you do the calculation, well, we could offset the warming effect of greenhouse gases. But let's think of what's happening. While we're doing this, CO2 is still building up in the atmosphere. It's still acidifying the oceans. And at the rate we're going, the Great Barrier Reef doesn't have another decade. Um, Ocean acidification is, is destroying our ocean biota, is destroying our coral reefs. So that problem persists. And anybody who's studied the climate system, and there are a number of experts in this room, so, uh, you know, the, the pattern of global warming doesn't look like the opposite of the pattern of volcanic cooling. So when you put them on top of each other, they don't cancel out. And the global average, maybe they'll cancel out. But some regions could actually warm even faster, while some regions cool. And most likely, you slow down the global hydrological cycle. Uh, what, what does that mean in normal language? Uh, we dry out the continents even more. Um, so, and that's just one of the schemes. And in just about all of these schemes, you run into the law of unintended consequences. Um, as I've remarked uh, in the past, there is only one truly safe potential geoengineering scheme, one form of technology that we could use to reverse climate change a time machine, but we, we don't have one, and we're not likely to have one in the near future. Um, so an argument can be made that studying the impacts, using models to study the potential impacts of geoengineering, 
can usefully inform the debate over whether we should implement it. And there's been some really good research, and my colleague Alan Roebuck at Rutgers um, wrote a, a great article, I think it's still up on the website of the Bulletin of the Atomic uh, Scientists, uh, which is uh, something like 20 reasons why not to do geoengineering, and it's based on the scientific work that he's done exploring uh, potential consequences. So thank you. Thanks, Steve. I this is a very interesting week because today the president is going to visit Puerto Rico and tomorrow he's going to visit Las, Las Vegas. So the question is, what are the odds that in the course of either of those visits he will address the underlying causes of each of them? Well, thanks for the question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'll give my estimate zero. Um, now let me provide a more nuanced response. Um, it's never the right time to talk. We have a cartoon in the book um, that sort of, and we have a discussion of um, the parallels between Superstorm Sandy and Sandy Hook, uh, because these were both great tragedies. In one case, it was a tragedy worsened by climate change. In the other case, it was a tragedy almost certainly brought apart upon by the lack of sensible gun laws in this country. And what did the gun lobby and the fossil fuel lobby say at the time? This is not the right time to talk about this problem. Um, anytime there's an, an opportunity for a, a, a sort of a teachable moment um, in the climate change debate or in the debate over gun policy, um, the vested interests who want to preserve the, st the status quo will do everything they can to poison the waters. And we saw that in the wake of these latest hurricanes, we saw um, Scott Pruitt uh, going out of his way to criticize scientists uh, like me and some of my colleagues saying we shouldn't be talking about how climate change might have worsened um, uh, this, uh, the impacts of this storm. That's politicizing a strategy. We've seen the same thing over the last few days with respect to this latest shooting. Um, if ever there were crocodile tears, these are them. Um, and what it is, it's an estimate, it, it's an attempt to, to try to discourage um, free and open conversation uh, and, 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 and consideration of um, why it is, what are the contributing factors that are leading to these disasters. So I, I think it's difficult not to recognize the parallels here. And it's the same talking point that's always trotted out. It's, this is not the right time to talk about uh, well, what about a week from now? No, that wouldn't be the right time to talk about it. How about next year? <laughs> That's certainly not the right time to talk about it. Thank you. Yes, you mentioned Scott Pruitt. <clears throat> Technically, he's my boss, or my boss's boss. <laughs> Sorry. <his> boss's <laughs> boss. yeah. I work at the EPA lab here in town. That's where we wrote the standards, the tailpipe standards <clears throat> for cars and uh, heavy-duty trucks. Um, two questions. One is, there's talk about what sort of level, target, we should have for carbon dioxide and maybe some of the other gases in order to stabilize the planet. Of course, there's 350.org. If you could comment on that and also comment uh, about the book Project Drawdown, that Paul Hawkins book, and uh, what you think about that and, and sort of the hierarchy, excuse me, hierarchy of, 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 you know, most important interventions down to the, the least. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, well, without going into the, the specifics of his book, I would say more generally, there is sort of this hierarchy. We sometimes talk about sort of no regrets. There are all sorts of things that we can do in our everyday lives um, that make us healthier. They save us money. They make us feel better. And they cut our carbon emissions, um, you know, bicycling to, to, to school. I, I still remember here in Ann Arbor. Um, during that sabbatical, my father would bicycle to, uh, to the math department, and there was a, a child seat that I sometimes got a ride on. Um, so bicycling to work um, and, you know, buying more fuel-efficient vehicles, um, electric hybrid vehicles, um, you know, recycling, more energy-efficient appliances. These are all things that we ought to be doing anyways, and they cut our carbon emissions, but it only gets us so far. So there is the, there, there's this sort of low-hanging fruit, and there's the stuff we ought to be doing, but to sort of get the, the sorts of reductions that will be necessary um, if we are to not burn through our carbon budget, the budget we have left before we commit to dangerous, more than 
two degrees Celsius, three and a half degree Fahrenheit warming. Um, that's going to require major market incentives. We're going to need a price signal in the market. And you know, Bill McKibben, who you mentioned, 350.org, um, has been. In, who, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll have to miss his presentation here. And, and I would encourage everybody to come out to, to listen to Bill because he's been a leader, um, uh, both in terms of. You know, raising awareness about the immediacy, the threat of climate change, and the fact that we can't burn through a budget, that we've got five times as much carbon in proven reserves of the fossil fuel companies as is necessary to, to give us dangerous two degrees Celsius warming. Um, but he's also tried to levy pressure against institutions, including universities, um, to divest themselves um, of fossil fuel holdings. Um, and there's a practical argument there, which is that if we decide, as we really need to, to act on this problem, then these companies are going to have major stranded assets. They're going to have to leave most of their assets in the ground. That makes them a bad long-term investment. So from an investment strategy, if it's a retirement fund, you ought not to be investing in them. But it, there's a symbolic uh, sort of um, point there as well. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I would say um, this, that, uh, you know, the, the, in terms of what's the, the safe level, uh, you know, Bill McKibben, based on the work of James Hansen, argues that um, 350 parts per million is the safe level. And then you say, well, aren't we over 400 right now? Yes, we're over 400. That, so that means we have to take carbon back out of the atmosphere. Um, that's a hard thing to do. Um, and, um, and, 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 and a case could be made, you know, that, hey, human civilization was built on a climate that corresponds with CO2 levels of 350 or lower, and that's really where we want to be. Um, but in the near term, we are, uh, you know, in a matter of a decade or so, going to burn through the budget we have left for even keeping warming below 2 degrees Celsius um, if we don't act. So first things first, we've got to bring those emissions down rapidly. I, I sometimes you know, I point out that if we had acted on this problem three decades ago, uh, my daughter is a much better skier than me. My 11-year-old daughter, she can go down the black double diamond slopes. I'm still on the bunny slopes, okay? And if we had acted three decades ago when we knew there was a problem, the emissions curve that we have to bring down, we'd be going down a bunny slope. It's pretty easy to do. I can do that. Um, what three decades or more of inaction has bought us is a trip down the black double diamond slope. That's how quickly we have to bring carbon emissions down. And so, yeah, there's the low hanging fruit, but that's not going to be enough. We're going to need major policy intervention here. Um, and we're going to need politicians who are going to reflect our interests rather than the fossil fuel interests um, that may be funding them, which means turning up at the voting booth and making your voice heard in that way. Thank you. Coincidentally or not, uh, the distinguished economist Angus Deaton is speaking at uh, the university this week. And his specialty is not climate change, but inequality, which is a reflection of some of the limitations of capitalism. Wait, who is this? Uh, the Angus D, the okay. Nobel laureate yeah. in economics. Yeah. Uh, and he, it's about a limitation of capitalism. Do you think that capitalism is inherently destructive of the environment? And, and if, if you listen to people from the Heartland Institute, that's what they're really afraid of. They talk about capitalism all the time. And even people on the left, uh, Naomi Klein, it, to pick a name, is also specifically talking about yeah. Can we address this without addressing perhaps even a bigger issue? Well, thanks for the question. It's funny, my uh, friend uh, Jonathan Overpeck, who's the new dean of your uh, College of the, the Environment, uh, School of the Environment, I forget the exact uh, uh, name of the, um, we were discussing this yesterday. There was a study that came out um, that actually looked at two uh, different proponents for action. Um, looked at Bill McKibben uh, versus Naomi Klein. Uh, Bill McKibben is articulating um, uh, uh, the case of acting within the market framework that exists. So working within the system that exists um, and, and solving the problem within that system by levying pressure on investors, um, the divestment movement, um, by um, you know, bringing to light the, the problem of uh, stranded assets, um, but working within the system that exists, whereas Naomi Klein as you allude to, is um, you know her her 
thesis is that um, capitalism intrinsically cannot solve a problem like climate change. Um, I tend not to side with her. I side more with Bill McKibben. I, I do think that we can solve this problem within the framework of a market economy. We've solved global environmental problems within the framework of market economies before, whether it was ozone depletion or acid rain. And, 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 and some of that success came under Republican administrations here in the United States. And we did that through market mechanisms. George H.W. Bush introduced cap and trade as a way, as a market mechanism um, for uh, dealing with acid rain. Um, so my view is that the problem is we don't have a level, uh, a level playing field. The, the, the market can solve a problem, but not when it's treated as an externality, not when there's no market signal to reflect the damage that's being done by some particular set of actions. The fact is that we are doing damage to the planet when we burn carbon, damage that we're not doing when we use renewable forms of energy. So we need an incentive structure, which is the opposite of what we have. Right now, we're actually giving subsidies and incentives, more of them, to the fossil fuel industry, which is the reverse of what we need to do. We need to de-incentivize those energy forms of energy um, uh, generation that are damaging the planet. Uh, and so you know, my view is that this problem, like other environmental problems that were solved through market mechanisms, this one's bigger, and it gets right at the the heart of what drives uh, our modern economies today, um, energy, uh, which is currently mostly fossil fuel driven. Um, but I, I don't see any reason why market mechanisms uh, cannot be used to solve this problem. So I, I guess it's a very long-winded way of saying that I side more with Bill and less uh, with Naomi, both of whom I respect tremendously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so first of all, I wanted to say that we brought our one credit mini course on sustainability here. So thank you everybody for visiting our classroom today. Um, second of all, I would like to say that um, I'm gonna make a somewhat bold assertion, but I think that it's justified in saying that everybody that's in this lecture room today has the responsibility of trying to disseminate the information that's being learned here. And if people take that responsibility seriously, it, or it, um, it just magnifies the impact of a lecture like this because we're all obviously, we care about this and we're moved by this. Um, and then my question for you, um, related to the phenomenon of people wanting to balance you know, the climate deniers with the climate scientists, it seems that we are so obsessed with being respectful and with having logical integrity and with all of these things, and those are important, you know, like we need to support di respectful discourse and we have to do things that are the right thing. But I also worry that we end up limiting ourselves from being as effective as we can be, and that alludes to what you're saying about scientists staying out of the political realm for the fear of politicizing their science, but if they do that, then we let the conversation be run by people who do not know the science. And I don't claim to know the answer, and I don't think anybody really does, but I'm curious about what you think about that and how you personally draw the line between using you know, your own senses to do what you think is right or fighting fire with fire. Well, thanks very much for the, <clears throat> for the question and, and for your suggestion. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, I'm... Uh, It's, I, I did write this op-ed, the title of which was, If You See Something, Say Something, uh, the New York Times op-ed. And of course, it's riffing off of the motto of our Department of Homeland Security, but it applies to us, us, us as scientists who are witnessing a major threat to our planet. And it would be uh, an abrogation, as I had said in the piece of responsibility, not to try to make sure that we inform the discussion about what to do about this ex existential threat. Now, I used to be of the mind that scientists should stay completely outside of the political realm. And in fact, um, in my book, I even point out there was a quote, uh, something I said at a, at a Senate hearing back in two, 2003 when I was asked, uh, actually by James Inhofe in that hearing, you know, uh, some question about uh, policy, about energy policy. And I said, well, you know, I don't see my role um, uh, as, you know, to, to, to speak about anything in the policy realm. Um, I have since uh, changed my view quite a bit, in part because of the experiences that I have you know, gone through 
and in what I like to think of the growth that I've undergone, um, where I've come to, again, uh, appreciate the fact that, um, you know, we all have the, the right to our opinions and to express our opinions. And I like to think that when it comes to matters of policy uh, implications of climate change, that um, you know, the fact that we actually study this problem, um, that, that it's our job to study this problem, uh, does inform our opinions in a way that's useful. Uh, our, our, our opinions about policy are informed by our understanding of what the science has to say. And uh, I think that it's appropriate for us to not try to prescribe the policy solutions. Um, I'm not out there, for example, saying that we should institute a revenue neutral carbon tax or cap and trade. What I am out there saying is that we should put a price on carbon, okay? As a generic proposition, we need to you know, somehow uh, deal with the, the externality of the environmental damage that's done by the emission of carbon. And I'm happy to leave it to our policymakers or politicians to debate in good faith how we go about solving that problem. And I think it's wonderful that you have conservatives like my friend Bob Inglis, a former congressman from South Carolina, died in the wool, Republican, conservative, um, had a nearly uh, perfect lifetime conservative voting record, uh, but um, became convinced that climate change was a real problem and started speaking out about it. And uh, as, a as a result, uh, found himself uh, facing a primary challenge um, by um, a, uh, another Republican who was well-funded by a couple brothers from Kansas, um, whose name shall go unsaid, um, and he lost that election. Um, the person who replaced him, a uh, politician you may have heard of, uh, Trey Gowdy. Um, but Bob is now traveling around the country lecturing to conservative audiences Sort of audiences that would probably throw rotten tomatoes at me if I entered into the into the auditorium, but they're happy to listen to Bob Inglis, um, who you know they perceive as sort of part of their you know tribal uh, group. Um, they're they're happy to listen to to Bob talk about conservative uh, proposals uh, for pricing carbon, revenue neutral carbon tax. Um, that's the debate we should be having. That's the conversation that we should be having among our politicians, not is climate change real? Um, I was uh, debating that very proposition in the U.S. House of Representatives um, last March, where I was invited uh, to testify against three climate change contrarians. So it was three contrarians uh, against one mainstream scientist, which is a good approximation, right, to the 97 to 99% of the scientists versus the 1%. Um, but as I've remarked, um, it wouldn't matter if they had had 100 or 200 witnesses on their side because science isn't on their side. Um, and, you know, we've got to get away from the fake political debate about whether there's a problem. There's a worthy debate to be had about how we solve the problem. I resist the temptation to try to be prescriptive in, in, in you know, dictating what policy prescriptions should be implemented to solve this problem. I would like to leave that to our policymakers, but it has to be informed, as I said in that op-ed, by an objective assessment of what the risks actually are. That has to be the starting point, and scientists, in my view, play a very important role as sort of the referees um, of that debate. So I just want to honor that we had a time here at 5.15 that we would be uh, ending this. Um, but Dr. Mann will be available afterward if you want to take maybe one or two more. Sure, one or two. And then sure. we'll go ahead and end, and then maybe you can meet in the, in the lobby or something. Well, or we could, we'll field questions for as long as you want to do it here. Maybe that's the best way to, okay. yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. Do we have another one? Yeah, question here. Yes, I'm a uh, longtime Ann Arborite and community activist. And could you give some, some direction, really, to students who are engaged with these questions and faculty, how to get out of the gown bubble into the Ann Arbor community and the Washtenaw County? We try and have a meeting to get activists together 
but there does seem to be a, a uh, not exactly an abyss, but not an easy bridge of communication between the gown and the town. And on a question like this, it really in involves the, the local government and all the levels of uh, self-government. Uh, this resource of the university is underutilized. And, and in terms of that, the various campaigns toward divestment, toward moving your money and so on, how can both students and community have a more beneficial, more effective influence on the university that it should itself be a divest from its fossil fuels and provide some moral leadership on that uh, score for all of Michigan? Well, thanks for the, the question. And um, you know, again, Bill, Bill McKibben, who's been leading the way on this, uh, will, will be here. And it'd be a great question to put to him as well. Um, you know, I do personally see the role of the divestment movement. Um, I, you know, if nothing else, I think it has been uh, powerful symbolically. The fact that the Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller Brothers Fund divested themselves. This is the legacy of the, of the fossil fuel industry, um, uh, the Rockefeller Brothers, and, uh, and they've divested themselves of fossil fuel holdings. The Gates Foundation has divested themselves of fossil fuel holdings. I actually spoke at the shareholders, annual shareholders uh, meeting of Berkshire Hathaway in Nebraska last spring um, to, uh, I was under a misapprehension. I thought I was gonna meet uh, Jimmy Buffett. Um, it turns out it was Warren Buffett. Um, but one of the things that we had, a, uh, we had a few minutes to speak directly to Warren Buffett and um, who accepts the science of climate change. He knows it's a problem. He just hasn't been convinced that uh, he should be willing to allow climate change to influence his, portfolio, his investment portfolio. And we pointed out that the chair of his board, um, Bill Gates, is divested. Maybe he needs to listen to his friend, his close friend, Bill Gates. Um, I think that sends a powerful message. And so even if one might debate the actual economic impact that divestment has, it has a very powerful um, symbolic impact. Um, I was uh, at UC Berkeley um, during uh, the 1980s when the uh, anti-apartheid movement began as a college movement and, um, and it had a real impact. Um, these movements have an impact. It starts with colleges, it starts with the ground, grassroots. Uh, I didn't finish the point I had made earlier. Um, Bill McKibben, the study found that his efforts have been very effective, uh, far more effective than Naomi Klein. Um, and so the sort of social movement that he's created is, is, is moving the dial on this. Um, so keep up, <laughs> keep up the pressure is what I would say. Absolutely, and you know, sometimes it's sort of preaching to the choir. Academic towns, um, you know, university towns tend to be progressive hubs, and so it's one thing to get something passed in the the, the, the town of Amherst where I grew up, or the city of Berkeley, or the you know the town of Ann Arbor. It's something else to get them passed in. in uh, but you know, you see mayors of some of the largest cities in the country, like Houston. Um, like uh, New York, um, like Los Angeles, who have taken a very proactive approach on climate. So thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so my question has to do with um, the fact that there are some well-credentialed climate scientists, um, such as uh, Judith uh, Curry, uh, who is the former uh, chair of the Atmospheric Science Department at Georgia Tech, who don't see uh, the evidence as nearly as clear or as dire as you present. Um, she, in fact, she, I think she resigned recently and spoke of, uh, wrote about um, what she felt was a kind of oppressive conformity that led her to leave academia. I wonder if you have some comments on that. Yeah, thanks. Um, so you do have contrarians um, in, you know, in the climate change arena, um, and you have some prominent scientists who have sort of made a, a, a career out of being uh, contrarians. Um, you know, Judith Curry, uh, interestingly enough, was sort of at the leading edge of um, what you might even call climate change alarmism. <laughs> um, back in uh, the mid-2000s, she was a co-author of an article uh, arguing for a very substantial increase in Category 5 hurricanes um, and, uh, and testified uh, 
uh, I believe in Congress about the, the dangerous impact that climate change is having on hurricanes and was playing a very prominent role in that discussion. And that sort of de degraded into a debate um, and uh, she uh, was heavily criticized for accusing a fairly um, senior scientist in our field um, she was quoted in the Wall Street Journal as referring to this scientist as brain fossilized um, and got pretty personal. And I think that that experience, um, well, I think that impacted her in a way that maybe has led to some loss of objectivity um, in the, the way she views the science and the role that she sees herself as playing. Uh, I have to be perfectly honest. I've seldom been able to make sense of her arguments. Um, you know, she uh, likes to uh, play up, and, and she was one of those three contrarian witnesses at that uh, House um, uh, Science Committee hearing that I testified at. Um, and um, she uh, spoke about uncertainty and the importance of uncertainty. Um, at one point, uh, one of the Republican uh, congressmen asked, well, did anyone want to weigh in on the issue of um, you know, uncertainty? And none of the other witnesses actually wanted to say anything. So I said, well, you know, I didn't think that the Republican was going to give me the floor, but I'm happy to take it. Uh, and I talked about something that Judith Curry seemed unwilling to talk about, which is the fact that uncertainty, if you talk to economists who actually study how scientific uncertainty translates to climate risk, uh, uncertainty ends up being a reason for even more concerted action uh, because uncertainty cuts both ways and it turns out the cost of having underestimated the impacts of climate change and under mitigated is far greater than the cost on the other side and so where you run into truly catastrophic outcomes are where it turns out that the, the, the uh, actual climate changes are at the upper end of the uncertainty range, um, and the costs end up being far larger than we had projected, and the cost of action ends up being even smaller um, in comparison with the cost of inaction. And if anything, the science bears that out. Uh, just within the last year or so, we have seen that um, the, the glaciological community has basically uncovered processes that were ignored in the climate. So here's an uncertainty. Here's something that wasn't in the models. So you say, ah, the models, they're not very good. Yeah, the models weren't very good about this. They had left out a critical process that has to do with the way that ice cliffs um, collapse um, when you warm the ice shelves. And because of the sloping geometry of the Antarctic continent, uh, because of the weight of the ice sheet, it slopes down. And so when you erode an ice cliff, the ice cliff behind it is even taller and the one behind it is even taller. That wasn't included in the models. When you include that, it turns out that West Antarctic ice sheet can collapse, we now find, uh, potentially far more rapidly than we thought, to the point where we now have to double our projected sea level rise relative to what the IPCC said just a few years ago. The IPCC said an upper end of about one meter, three feet or so of sea level rise. Now the best av available science says we can't rule out six feet of sea level rise because yes, there are uncertainties and as we work through them and as we learn more, we're finding that in many respects, uh, the problem is potentially worse. So uncertainty just doesn't play out the way contrarians like Judith Curry would like us and would like politicians to think it does. But thank you for the question. Uh, Wait, one yes. more, sure. Yeah, why not? <laughs> yes, uh, I am not a uh, human overpopulation dire. Now, you know, if you, if you say, I agree certainly that if you, you can't solve a problem if you don't recognize the causes. And the causes of global warming are basically that we have too many people on this planet consuming too many resources and land. And I, I, if we don't believe that, I, I think you need to ask, each of you here in this room needs to ask how we're going to raise the living standards and the consumption of land for everyone, all seven and a half billion people in the world, to average current American living standards. And let alone the fact that in 2100, we're going to have 10 or 11 billion people. I, I think it just doesn't work, whatever you're planning. And I don't understand why the left continually 
ignores human overpopulation. Huh. Well, it's sort of interesting because a good friend of mine, Paul Ehrlich, um, was heavily criticized um, uh, for bringing the problem of human population to the forefront of the discussion back in the 1960s with his book, The Population Bomb. So he's often vilified by the right. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's sort of, um, you know. I'm not I, of right. In, I'm an independent. Well, you know, you, so, sorry, but you were talking about the, the, le you know, yes, the, 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 the left. Yes, because the left, yeah. the left yeah. is for mass immigration. They want to build the U.S. population to six to eight hundred. So let me let me answer. By yeah. Twenty one hundred through okay. mass immigration. Okay. That's crazy. I've heard your question. Let me uh, let me answer it. Thanks. Um, so uh, yeah. So I mean, again, people like uh, Paul Ehrlich, who have been uh, vilified, were actually bringing you know to our attention the the problem of overpopulation decades ago. Um, and you've alluded to something which is important here, um, that it isn't just the, the number of people, it's the sort of lifestyle that they're leading. Uh, in fact, there's a, an identity, we call it the Kaya identity, which is a way of estimating um, carbon emissions by looking at you know, how many people are there um, and how much energy are they using and how are they getting that energy. And so you can express sort of our carbon output as a product of, of different terms, each of which we can try to get a handle on. How many people are there? What is the sort of... Um, you know, the carbon intensity, how carbon, uh, you know, how reliant are they on carbon to get energy and what sort of energy intensity, how much do they rely on energy to generate uh, GDP. Um, so it's a product of these terms. Now, uh, Bill Gates actually uh, discovered this um, uh, equation a, a few years ago until it was pointed out to him that it had been discovered two decades ago. But on his blog, he was very excited about the fact that he had found this equation that could be used to estimate, well, that he had rediscovered the Kaya identity, which is uh, uh, some decades old. Um, but you put your finger again on something really important, which is it isn't just the number of people, it's what sort of lifestyle. Um, a large number of people um, leading a fairly energy, unintensive lifestyle won't generate as much carbon and even if they're using an energy and if they're living in an energy intensive lifestyle if they're not getting their energy from fossil fuels but re renewables they still won't generate uh, more carbon so so you can't just what look at the number land? biodiversity yeah. is also you shoot those yeah. things you do it away when you have large, huge numbers of people. The planet wasn't built for 10 billion people in 2100. Well, you know, and, and that's, uh, you put your finger on something else which is important, that we're just talking about one dimension of a multi-dimensional problem, which is environmental sustainability. Climate change is just one dimension of that problem. If we are to live sustainably on this planet, then we can't be overfishing and we can't be overexploiting the land. And it, it turns out, it, there, there's a, a nice literature, which I think you find relevant, um, and you might check out, uh, uh, it, it, which falls under the uh, rubric of, uh, of uh, planetary boundaries. Um, we're looking at the various limitations on you know, the natural resources that we rely upon. Uh, so climate change is one of those, but uh, food and water, and looking at you know, uh, how far are we out on the spectrum of overextending ourselves um, beyond the boundary of sustainability. By some estimates, now again, I'm not an expert, um, but some experts have concluded that we are maybe a factor of seven times larger than in terms of the footprint, the environmental footprint that we have right now, we're about seven times the carrying capacity of the planet. Um, that, that's a problem. <laughs> And so I think we're basically in agreement here, sir. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, one more, sure. Yep. Uh, as you pointed out, uh, even if all the nations lived up to their voluntary commitments to the Paris Accord, it would still get us only partway to that one and a half to two degrees. I'm wondering, is there a danger of that accord becoming sort of a fig leaf where nations can say, yes, we've pledged to do this, but with no, uh, no teeth in it, uh, they do nothing until it's too late. Well, you know, that's where um, issues of um, accountability and enforcement come in. And one of the criticisms of the Paris Accord is that it's, uh, you know, the, that it, it isn't enforceable uh, by international, through international law. Um, it's the enforcement mechanism is a, a name and shame. It's a peer pressure. It's if you don't do your part, then you will. 
um, be a pariah in the global community. Um, and there's some evidence that that sort of works. Um, you know, I, I guess the, 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 the um, you know, the real test will be uh, over the next few years to, to really see on paper, to look at the numbers and see how well various um, participating nations are doing in meeting their obligations. Um, as you may well know, there are issues with reporting, and one of the criticisms of China has been that um, their own reported carbon emissions numbers seem a little fishy. Um, and so do we have verifiable data that we can actually use to determine who is and is not making good on their commitments that's going to be important and that is you know that is a potential weak point is um, enforcement and uh, and, um, and 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 validation me measurement um, uh, you know uh, assessing actual progress um, so that's you know what we'll see and if things seem to be going well then you know, that means that, wait, you know, we have something here we can build on and we can ratchet up those commitments. If things aren't going well and countries aren't making good on their commitments, then, then we have a problem. Hi. I'm wondering Hi. if you'll take one more. Sure. The you'll, you'll be the last one. How's that? <laughs> um, and you'll forgive me for not making eye contact. I had to write down my thoughts. Um, what systems or programs do you know of that are already in place to make information on climate change more accessible to those without prior knowledge or resources to being informed? due to income inequality. Shout out to my social movements class. Um, because not only those with higher education or technological resources to be informed have a role to plan climate change or stakes in the matter if conditions do get worse. Additionally, if these don't exist, um, what is your take on how to involve those aforementioned in the conversation? It, it, uh, what was that last statement? What is your take on how to involve those people aforementioned in the conversation? Yeah, so, so this, this, this is an issue that um, you know information is not as readily available to certain communities as it is to others, and um, and it's always difficult to 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 assess the reliability of information and to be able to ensure that information is reliable. Um, you know, part of it is uh, I think. Um, you know, choosing those who you view as trusted messengers. Um, you know, and if you like what I have to say, you can follow me on Twitter, <laughs> and you know, and you'll you'll get my angle on this because I like to tweet links to articles that I think are important and to, you know, things that I think people should know about. Um, and so, social media is, to some extent, a democratizing tool. Um, it has its problems, as we've seen now, um, writ large and you know, the way it may have been used in this latest election, but social media can be a real, a very useful way of um, accessing information. Um, and, you know, all you need is, uh, is, a, is a smartphone or access to a... Right, yeah. I think you're missing it. So I'm talking about those without access to computers, perhaps. Yeah, okay. Because okay. Of, you know, yeah. Lack of social mobility, and so what, what do you yeah. think about that outreach-wise? So that's that's more of a challenge, right? Um, and you know, uh, I mean, it requires more of an effort. Uh, you know, for those, you know, and frankly, if you're struggling to put food on the table um, and to, and for access to to clean water. It's understandable that climate change may not be at the at the top of your sort of attention agenda. Um, there is, in my view, a responsibility uh, among those of us, those who are better off um, and have better access to to those resources, to to to, to sort of take up the mantle of, of those who, who don't have that access um, and to do more because. One of the injustices of climate change, and this is where climate justice, a very important part of the problem, um, is that the greatest harm, um, and this is true with environmental degradation in general, uh, it's always been the case that the, those who feel the greatest impacts, who uh, experience the, the, the greatest harm, are those who had the least to do with creating the problem in the first place. That's true generationally, but it's also true in a distributional sense um, with respect to income and to sort of the, uh, you know, the, the industrial world uh, versus the developing world. Um, and so one of the arguments is that, um, you know, that those of us who created th this problem, you know, the, the Western nations that had access to two centuries of cheap, dirty energy have this additional obligation 
to, to take up some of that additional responsibility. Um, so I think that's, that's part of it. Um, and to recognize that people who are struggling to put food and water, you know, and, and, and drink, you know, drinkable water on the table, uh, have their, you know, rightfully are focused on, on those activities. And, and something that we all appreciate, I think, in the wake of what's happened with Puerto Rico, and I would encourage people to help out. Um, there are some verifiable uh, charities that you can donate to that are helping those folks. I mean, it, what we, the fact that we're witnessing this in America is, is, um, is appalling. Um, you know, it's not a third world country, it's, it's our country, and we're allowing this to happen. Thank you. Thank you.